Uh, hi everyone, welcome and thanks for tuning into this little talk about the perils and pitfalls of writing the genre series. Uh, again, my name is Jim Spivey and before I joined the Readsy Network where I get to partner with awesome authors like you guys and help you hone your stories, I was an editor at DC Comics and a managing editor for the Yen Press and Orbit Imprints of Hachette Book Group. Quick disclaimer, uh, the series I'll be mentioning today are example, as examples are my personal favorites. Uh, some of them were already called out uh, when you guys were joining the talk. Uh, but they are not representative of all the absolute best series that are out there. That said, if you haven't heard of some of these series, I really encourage you to check them out. I really like them, and I think they're great examples of what you can do with a series. Now, when it comes to genre fiction, and by that I mean science fiction, fantasy, mystery, thrillers, horror, romance, and all those kinds of related mashups, uh, many authors approach it with a series mentality, in that rather than conceiving and writing a single book, they think of it as several. While the genre fiction series isn't a new concept, Doom was conceived as a series, uh, the genre fiction landscape being dominated by series is fairly recent. Uh, and that's a shift in the publishing paradigm that's been promoted by the success of one book series after another. But for every successful series, there are far too many that aren't, which makes it difficult for even an exceptional new series to get noticed. Uh, as an added hurdle, while many publishers may seem outwardly on the hunt for the next big series, they're a difficult sell when you're an emerging author. So what I hope to do with you guys today is look at the various ways I see authors stumble when developing a series and provide some guidance on how to avoid those pitfalls. To start off with, let's do a couple of, uh, couple of definitions. Uh, there are two kinds of series. The first is the character-driven series and then there's the overarching stories. Uh, to, uh, the overarching story is when each book in the series is leading up to a climactic final volume that either promises a big battle or a major revelation or both. Uh, good examples of that are The Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire, and the News Flesh trilogy by Shauna McGuire, uh, which came out from Orbit Books. Now, the overarching story is probably what most people think of when they think of a book series, but typically it's reserved for science fiction and fantasy, particularly like epic fantasy. Uh, all the books in a series uh, in some way advance the overall story, with a new clue being found, or a henchperson of the big bag getting defeated, that sort of thing. Uh, the character-driven series, on the other hand, is when each book is a self-contained story featuring a recurring character. Great examples of this are the Spencer series by Robert B. Parker. Uh, glad to see that some of you guys really like that. Uh, also, uh, the Jack Ryan books by Tom Clancy. Uh, the Matthew Swift urban fantasy series by Kate Griffin. That's another one of my favorites from Orbit. Or Conan the Barbarian and John Carter of Mars. The character-driven series is usually used uh, in mysteries, but also it, it ends up in fantasy and in thrillers. Volumes in this kind of series often end with a status quo change for the lead character, such as romantic partners breaking up, uh, the lead character getting a promotion at work, uh, or a serious injury to the, to the lead character or one of his friends or family. Now, the character-driven series is obviously much easier to continue uh, because the lead character or his or her descendants or related characters can always find themselves in a new story. Now, much like genre mashups, uh, many series are a hybrid of these two types, but they tend to skew more toward the overarching paradigm story. So even though they feature a, you know, a single you know, a, a primary lead character over the series, it's still a, you know, a much bigger story. So examples of that are, of course, Harry Potter or the Dark Tower series from Stephen King. Now, while I'm sure that you're already aware of this, writing a series is not something to be taken lightly. 
Uh, writing a standalone piece of fiction is hard enough, uh, but with the series you have a lot more moving parts and each individual book has to advance a bigger story. So it's important for you to have a plan. Just like you should outline each book in the series, so too do you need to outline the series itself, mapping out each advancement in the overall story, both in terms of the series' ultimate goal, but also how the characters need to develop in order to contribute to that goal. If you're creating an overarching story, there really should be a definitive endpoint. This isn't to say that you can't revisit the characters or world in a later series, but leaving the series open-ended at the outset can lead to the story meandering, and readers will eventually drift away if there isn't a payoff to their investment. Uh, a really good example of a series of series is The Chronicles of Thomas Covenant. Uh, it's an epic fantasy series by Stephen R. Donaldson. And the whole series is ten books long, but it's divided up into two trilogies and then a final quartology. So, you know, it's, it's in digestible chunks. Now, if, if I was pressed for a suggestion on how long to make your first series, I would suggest the trilogy. Uh, it's both a classic and also it allows uh, you as the writer to create a three-act structure for the series as well as echoing that kind of structure in each of the volumes. So, uh, character-driven series can also benefit from having a definitive endpoint as it gives your series a clear goal to reach by a certain volume. Uh, endpoints for, for those kinds of series uh, are usually some kind of character-defining moment, uh, such as an end to a long-standing rivalry, or a status change at their job, or maybe they're a military person so they move up in rank, uh, or it could be a big life change, just like getting married or divorced. So, the other thing about uh, working with the series is that the stakes have to start out big and just keep getting bigger. Uh, in the, the Harry Potter series is a great example of this. We know from the outset that Harry has to face Voldemort, but with each successive volume, we're shown how Voldemort's power is growing exponentially, and also how much Harry has to grow as a character and develop uh, in terms of his gifts so that he can ultimately defeat him. Now, many times... Uh, subsequent novels were sequels instead of a specifically planned series. Uh, some great series didn't even start out that way, uh, or expanded from something that was originally planned to be a much shorter run. Uh, so uh, a, a, a neat example of this is Piers Anthony's Xanth's trilogy, which started out as three books but is now 40 books long. So... Uh, now that, we've, now that we've laid the groundwork and we've, we've gone over some initial questions, let's talk about what I see as the three biggest pitfalls of writing a genre series. Now, speaking of the idea that a series is more like one book that spawns a series of sequels, let's discuss first what is perhaps the, what I feel is the biggest pitfall in writing a series, and that's thinking of book one uh, thinking of your first book as book one in a series rather than its own individual uh, entity. Very frequently when I'm asked to edit the first book in a series, the whole thing reads like a very long act one, rather than a compelling read on its own with, with, a, with its own complete and very distinct three-act structure of a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, the most important thing to, to remember is that if your readers aren't satisfied with the first book, they are really not going to care that it's part of a series. And no manner of perilous cliffhanger will convince them otherwise. You know, it doesn't matter if, you know, literal jaws of death, if they're not intrigued by that first, by that first book, they're not going to stick around. You have to engage your reader fully at the start with a satisfying and somewhat self-contained story and then tease them enough that they're interested to see what's going to happen next. Again, reader engagement does not come artificially from devices like cliffhangers or other stunts that rely on information or payoffs that won't come until a later volume. Now, this isn't to say that a series can't use them, and the great series do only that they can't be the sole device that you're using to lure the reader into picking up the next volume. 
the story in the current volume has to feel complete and be compelling first. The cliffhanger or tease is only there to show how stakes will increase in the next volume. And remember, you know, look at look at uh, the Acclaim series. Uh, the book that has all of the awards and most of the acclaim is generally book one. It's not book three, not book four. Sometimes it's the last book, but it's really going to be that first book. Now, when writing any book in a series, especially the first one, it needs to be plied out in such a way that a reader can pick up any volume and get a complete story, not just a chapter in a longer saga. As such, a recap of the current status quo, you know, the main characters, their motivations, their relationships, uh, and any major pending conflicts has to be organically integrated into each volume. Harry Potter, again, it's a great example of this. With each volume, you're reintroduced to Harry, Hermione, Ron, all of the cast. You know what their relationships are. You know, uh, what, you know what year in school they are. You know what they're getting ready to study. And you find out, and you're reminded that Voldemort is this big bad that, that ultimately Harry is going to have to defeat. Again, it, it, Harry Potter is, is just so good at making it it, you know, it's setting up the story in such a way that you can pick up any book in the series and get a really great read. Um, again, book one can't be act one or just the beginning. It has to have its own beginning, middle, and an end, and the character arcs have to have some sense of closure and potentially a sense of accomplishment. Uh, character arcs are particularly important as character development needs to be an ongoing process with successes and failures happening in each volume. Uh, these can then stack, of course, uh, to force the characters into who they need to be by the end of the series. Uh, as a developing author, selling a book series to a publisher is hard. There's just no way around it. And you can't count on your series taking off if you self-publish. So the better way to approach things is to write book one with the idea that if the series doesn't happen, your readers will still walk away having enjoyed a complete story. Uh, this refers back to what I was saying earlier about the idea that a series is really more just a, a single book that then spawns a series of sequels that are related and may lead to, uh, and, and that will lead to a final goal. Okay, so now that we've looked at the biggest pitfall and we've uh, had some really great questions about it, uh, let's go ahead and talk about the, what I see as the second biggest pitfall. And this gets back to something I was mentioning earlier about having a plan, and pitfall number two is not having that plan. Uh, like I said from the start, one of the most important steps you need to take when developing your series is to fully plan it out. Uh, this doesn't mean that the plan can't change or mutate along the way, only that you need a roadmap. Uh, I don't know uh, what you guys are like, but I'm navigationally challenged. So that means if I'm going to go on a road trip, I need a roadmap. Same thing works with a series. Uh, and, you know, you don't want to be navigationally challenged when you're trying to write a series. Again, too many moving parts. Um, so when making your plan, keep in mind that everything and everyone introduced in the series has to have a purpose, one that relates to both the current volume and the overall series. The reason why you want to do that is that you want to be careful of the Miss, what I call the Miss Marple syndrome, uh, where key characters or pieces of information are introduced so late that they can read as a deus ex machina, you know, just that they're there for the convenience of needing to be there. Uh, so you need to make such introductions part of your plan and tease them and develop them as the series progresses. Uh, now this plan generally takes the form of outlining the major plot of each individual volume, the subplots that advance the overall arc, the new characters and information that is introduced, how elements that are already in play are going to be further teased or developed, what this, and what the status quo is going to be at the end of the volume, and how the stakes are going to be raised for the next volume. Now, one of the best ways to set up this plan, or at least I think one of the best ways, uh, is to do it with a grid. And 
that sets up, uh, you have an A plot, which is the three act story happening in that specific volume. Then a series of B, C, D, and so on subplots, which are the elements that relate to the series' bigger story. As you might guess, the letters have to do with their importance to that particular volume, as well as how much airtime they're going to get in that, you know, in that specific volume, and how close they are to becoming the A plot for a particular volume. So, as a very simple example, the B plot of book one would be your A plot of book two, the C plot will bubble to the top in book three, and so on. Uh, but it doesn't have to be that simple. Uh, the better plotted series aren't. You don't necessarily have to be afraid to have one plot stay at D status for a couple of volumes uh, before advancing it to C, or even just skipping ahead and making it a B, you know, moving it up to B status. Uh, similar, you know, you know, along the same lines, you can play with the reader's expectations by having a B plot simmer down to a C for a volume <coughs> before starting to advance it again. Excuse me a second. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that a B-plot may not necessarily move up to an A-plot. It may just simply resolve as a B-plot. So the grid should also outline the developments for each and every character, uh, key character, and how these changes are going to play into the story for that volume and affect the series as a whole. Uh, these developments may also be reflected in one of the volume's letter plots. And uh, going back to what I was saying earlier about uh, character arcs, make sure that your characters have a complete arc that has some sense of closure by the end of the volume, even if it's as simple as they move from one physical place to another. Uh, looking again at, at Harry Potter, uh, keep in mind that, and, and remember that Ron, Hermione, and the rest develop as their own characters and often have their own arcs within the A plot, and these arcs can have an effect on whatever challenge Harry is facing or his ultimate uh, face-off against Voldemort. Uh, another big benefit of the grid is that it gives you an immediate visual as to whether or not you're trying to do too much or maybe not enough in a particular volume. But most important, it makes it easier to keep track of your various plot threads and assure that none of them become lost where too much time passes before they're mentioned again or stalled where it spends too much time at a particular level of importance. Uh, you'll see there uh, as a pinned comment uh, that I provided the folks at Readsy with a sample grid, uh, and so uh, that'll be a, a link so that you can get it. Now, the one thing to keep in mind is uh, this particular grid is from my DC Comics days, so it's not quite the same as what you might want to do when creating a, a prose novel series, but it's a good visual example of what I'm talking about, and it, it breaks it down in very simple terms. You know, like Brainiac attacks, and you know, Brainiac is getting ready to attack, and then he attacks. Or uh, Lois Lane, her father is feeling ill and may ultimately pass. Uh, Clark Kent loses his job at the Daily Planet, and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, uh, Check out that, that link uh, for an example grid. So that is pitfall number two, uh, not having a plan. So we're going to dive into some quick questions. Uh, oh, why do some of the plots on the grid have asterisks? Uh, again, that, that's a very specific thing having to do with comics where an A plot is going to span out over a couple of issues because it's so big. Uh, when you're putting together your grids for your novels, your, your A plot is really only going to come into play in one novel. So, uh, we've talked about the, the first two pitfalls, which are pretty major pitfalls, uh, but this last one is more what I would call a minor peril, and one that maybe you won't encounter. And that's in, uh, choosing the wrong, uh, the wrong type of book to use as your source inspiration. Uh, this can happen a little bit more with authors who are, or I found it, uh, that it happens a bit more with authors who are very into comic books and manga, and unfortunately neither of them is a good model for how to construct a prose series. Like I said, I put in that disclaimer about the grid that I provided. It's, you know, it's set up for a comic series, and it's a, it's a good visual of how to set up a grid, but 
the serialized storytelling that you do in comics and manga is a lot more open-ended and has more in common with the soap opera than with, uh, with prose novel series. So if you're looking for uh, inspiration or a model of how to set up your own series, uh, look for similar book series, you know, things that are in the, uh, that are in the same genre or even share some kind of story similarities with what you're trying to do. Uh, by the same token, just use these sources as research on the mechanics of how to write a series. You know, find your favorite series and look at how those authors set up those stories, when they gave the reveals, how they teased out those subplots, how long they teased out those subplots. Uh, the, the reason why I say that is in a, in a market that's already flooded with series and a lot of really great series, the best way for a developing author to get noticed is through originality. Not by being the next Harry Potter, the next Diversion, Twilight, Tom Clancy, or whatever. So, that pretty much is, is the bulk of my talk. I really do appreciate you guys coming. Uh, I hope that you had a good time. I hope that you learned something. Uh, and found it useful, maybe a little bit entertaining, I hope. Uh, certainly, if you're interested in asking me to be your editorial partners on your series, I'm more than happy to, and Martin, our wonderful moderator, has just uh, pinned my, my profile there. Uh, so certainly come, you know, pitch, and uh, we'll see if we can work it into my schedule. Uh, and don't forget about Reezy Learning at reezy.com slash learning. It's chock full of good stuff on basic and advanced topics, so check it out and try your first free course. Uh, thanks again for being here. Uh, I look forward to working with you guys, and good luck with your series. Awesome. Have a good one.